70 days? Actually, actually, in the in the in the prison camp at Nuremberg, we were there for 20 days, and then the American army started to get so close that we were had to leave again. Only this time we had to walk from Nuremberg to Mooseburg, which then and this was about two weeks to do that. I can vividly remember the very first day uh, where we had to camp in the woods. And it was cold. It was so cold. And all we had was one blanket between the two of us. We couldn't make any fires because the, the British were bombing at night. And so we was just so cold that my friend and I we both got under that blanket, and I'd hug his back for a while, and then we'd reverse, and he'd hug my back for a while so that we wouldn't be too cold. The next day, as we were marching out, it was getting more like in an in a area that was flat. And all of a sudden, there was a, an air raid. And all of us went off to the side into the woods, off in the woods. And we heard rat-a-tat-tat, boom, 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 and everything. And didn't know really what had happened, except that uh, there was a lot of uh, machine gun fire and everything. And then the all-clear sounded. And more, one more thing about that. There was a stream about, oh, I would say eight feet wide, not very deep, but eight feet wide. Mm -hmm. It looked like maybe it was an irrigation thing or something. And when I would come off that road and went across that stream, I didn't even touch the water. I was going so fast to get up in the mm -hmm. behind a tree. And then when, when we came back, see, you can walk on water, in other words, and I came back and and then I walked across the water, and my feet got wet. And then about maybe uh, uh, two or three hundred yards down the road, we could see why all of this commotion. And there was a steam engine, a, a real old steam engine, uh, with holes in it and steam hissing out of it. And on the side of the road were 21 prisoners of war that were in the way and got killed. And what had happened is that a P-47 fighter was coming down to destroy that engine. They weren't trying to get us, they were after that engine and they were just in the way. And these were people that I knew and had seen in the camp and that, and there they were laying, 21 of them, on the side of the road that had perished because of this war. And so uh, we went on, and on this was one of really, the, the, probably the, the easiest and most enjoyable part of this time I was there in Germany, a prisoner, is that we were able to sleep in, in haylofts, in barns, at the different farms en route. We were able to bargain with the farmers uh, with the stuff out of our Red Cross parcels, the cigarettes, the soap, and things like that, to get eggs and to get uh, potatoes and different things like that that we would cook ourselves on the side of the road. And this uh, uh, really was, wasn't was bad. Oh, some of the best night's sleep I got was in a hayloft. Because, you know, you were so tired. And, you know, something else that was in these Red Cross parcels was a roll of toilet paper. And so every once in a while, you know, when there'd be airplanes flying around and everything, we'd take a roll of this toilet paper out in the field and write P-O-W with the toilet paper, P-O-W so that the American fighter planes and that that were flying around 
could see that we were prisoners of war and that we were not German troops, you know, maybe retreating or something like that. And so we would do that every once in a while, write POW. And I never forget one time there was a P-51. That was really the most famous fighter in World War II in Germany, was the P-51. They were the ones that escorted the bomber groups. And, uh, and I can remember one of those P-51s coming down over the group, not parallel, but like this. And he came so low that you could see the insignia on his cap. You could see that insignia. And he waved at us, and then when that plane went up, he goes like this, see, with the wing. And then we thought, hey, they know we're here. They know we're prisoners of war, and I'm sure he's going to report that to the Air Force. See? Uh, then we got to another small town there some, uh, uh, where we had slept in a church house overnight. And when we went back in 1995, we were back there in that same town, in that same church, and, uh, and they fed us you know, when we were tourists in 1995. And it was just so heartwarming to see how nice and wonderful the German people were in welcoming us, I'm getting all tongue-tied now, welcoming us to Germany and, and feeding us and taking care of us and, and saying, hey, we're happy you're here, uh, and, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up then in the prison camp in Mooseburg. Now this this uh, this was the last prison camp. See, and all of these from Stalag Luft Number Three, ending up in Nuremberg. All of them from Wetzlar and coming to Nuremberg, and all of the others, all going to Mooseburg. That was the last prison camp uh, where you couldn't be moved anymore. And uh, that's when the American Army on April the 25th, 29th, actually, 29th, that's the date I can remember, April the 29th, 1945. And the day before that, there was a Piper Cub come flying over the prison camp. A Piper Cub is a small airplane that had the insignia of the U.S. Army on it and the star, you know, and he come flying over the prison camp and going like this and waving at us and things. And the day before, we had heard artillery fire off in the distance. And so we thought, hey, things are looking up now. They're looking up. And so uh, uh, the next morning, we woke up, and the guards were all gone. They'd left. And we heard a rumbling sound coming, and it was American tanks. And the lead tank had General George S. Patton sitting right up on the top of the turret. And this tank turned into the prison camp and knocked down two gates, going down the middle of the prison camp and going right down the middle of the main street in this prison camp. And all of us there cheering and all of that sort of thing. That very same day, that very same day, a army kitchen moved in to the prison camp, an army kitchen. And the first meal that we had, I'll never forget it, was chicken a la king. You know what chicken a la king is? Well, that's a chicken that is prepared and it's got a kind of a cream sauce in it and, and that, you know. And white bread, a slice of white bread. And that was the first meal that we had after we were liberated, right there in that prison camp. The next day, the very next day, there were a bunch of bulldozers you know what a bulldozer is? Earth movers. And we're, we're uh, making runways next to the prison camp out of, out of all the farmland and just leveling it all off. 
And then these C-47s started coming in, one at a time. That's where the plane with two engines on it, on the C-47, they're the ones that that the airborne used when they uh, dropped after, you know, the invasion of Normandy and behind the enemy lines and that, all these parachutes. You've seen movies of that, I'm sure. And they started coming in, and they'd just stop and load, load up with a bunch of us and take off. Another one come, load a bunch of us, take off. Just steady straight until all of us, all of the Americans, ended up in La Havre, France. And in La Havre, France, there was a tent city that was set up. And this tent city, uh, where they had uh, uh, cots and everything, and uh, that we uh, they deloused us, and they they get we got showers, and we got all new uniforms and everything, and all of this good food, eggnog, and things like that, you know, try to fatten us up and and get us healthy again, and all of that sort of thing. And and I just remember, I oh, I slept so good. And then they put us on a Liberty ship, and there would be like a hundred and. 80 of us on this Liberty ship. Now, the Liberty ship was real slow, and it took 14 days to get across the Atlantic Ocean in this Liberty ship. And they, uh, they fed us steak and eggs, fresh steaks and eggs and, and uh, eggnog and all of that sort of thing. Never ate so good in my life. Three or four meals a day sometimes four meals a day, eating all the time if we wanted to. Because some of these prisoners had been prisoners for as much as five years, you know, three, four, five years. And so I was really one of the more healthy ones because it was only like 63 days. And so we got over to uh, Camp Mead in, uh, in New Jersey on the east coast of the United States. And and we were processed there and everything, and then they put us on a train going towards Salt Lake City, Utah, going across that same plane in a train that my parents did in 1923, in January of 1923, when they immigrated to the United States and going on the same tracks and everything and got home and went to this same place, Fort Douglas, on the east uh, bench there of the mountains in Salt Lake City. I was in that same place looking out at the windows at the lights of Salt Lake City twinkling down there. And uh, I was able to call home and tell them I was here and that I'd be home tomorrow. Well, I got in and got a taxi cab, and the taxi cab took me home in Salt Lake City. And my mother and my father and my four little brothers were there waiting for me. And that was so different, you know, that was three and a half years later. And that was so different than that first day when I went into the armed forces and, and all of these things started to happen. And I'm just really grateful, you know, that I'm that I'm alive, and that everything is going well in my life, and and so that's kind of what what the story is of what happened to me during that very short period of time in Germany. And did you have later on any nightmares caused by your experiences oh, during well, the war? Oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, once in a while. Even today, you know, you, you, you think about it. You think about that day when you were bailing out and things like that. But I, I don't think they're really nightmares. They're only remembrances, mm -hmm. you know, that keep once in a while keep reflecting back and everything. I'm even having try, trouble remembering what this girl I almost married looks like, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, I, uh, you yeah, know, I... I But no, I don't. I don't think I lose any sleep over it. Mm -hmm. I, I did at first, 
I did it first, but you know, time heals. Time heals all wounds. Mm -hmm. And if you get a really wonderful wife like I've got, I've been married to her for almost 56 years now, and she's taken good care of me. And so how could you have it any better? And uh, how often did your aircraft be uh, hit by flak or other? I, uh, it's a <clears throat> there was there was one mission. There was one mission that we went on. That we got back, and there were three hundred plus holes in the airplane. Three hundred holes in the airplane. In one, uh, and right behind the uh, uh, the top turret gunner. There was a hole three inches in diameter in the bottom of the plane and in the top, hmm. which means that one of those shells come up, went right through the airplane and didn't explode. And I think hmm. that was really the closest that maybe the end would have happened. Mm -hmm. You know. Okay, what did you do at D-Day? Well, on, on D-Day, mm -hmm. in D-Day, of course, that's uh, when uh, the the American and the British Army and the French and all invaded Normandy. And so we went on two missions that day. Two missions. And these uh, were, of course, missions to destroy the defenses you know, that the German army and everything had had set up. And uh, and we went on two missions, but they were low-flying missions, which means, you know, you're going five or 6,000 feet, so you're real close to the ground. And there's a lot of danger there, because they can just shoot up with guns and everything. And uh, But they, we went on two missions, but there was no incidents or anything. Mm. We did go, uh, but there, but I did go on two missions that day. Mm -hmm. You dropped not only bombs, you dropped uh, propaganda sheets? You must well, probably. probably, but I was never yeah. involved in that. No. you never seen one? No. Mm. Okay. Yeah. What do you think, how many prisoners uh, stayed in the camp in Nuremberg? Oh, I don't. I know that it, that it was designed now, I, I don't know these numbers are accurate, but they're relatives, relative. Uh, the Nuremberg prison camp was designed maybe for 6,000 prisoners. Hmm. By the end of the war, there were like 60,000, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and particularly at Mooseburg, too, the same thing. I mean, they were not designed to be have a lot of prisoners. You know, like Stalag Luft number three was designed to hold a lot more, you know. Nuremberg was designed to hold more than than Mooseberg was. Uh, 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 Wetzler was designed to hold so many, see, and when all those started accumulating, mm -hmm. then the next thing you know, you were really getting a lot of, uh, a lot of prisoners in one place. Where, where there's no place to sleep, where you had to sleep different times of the day, uh, different things like that to, to make do. But at Mooseburg, it wasn't very long, see. Mm -hmm. It wasn't very long. Okay, the last question. Uh, do you think uh, bombing and this area bombing uh, was the only thing that could stop the Nazis and that could stop Adolf Hitler? I don't know. Mm. Do I, you, I, you know, I can't answer that question. Uh, I, I, I know that uh, that it that it's a terrible thing. I know that you, uh, but I can't answer the question of whether or not I personally feel like I didn't even think of that. You know, I was just did like I told you before what I was told to do, and it's a you know it's not it's it's not good that all those people got killed and things that all those cities got destroyed and everything, but you got to remember though 
that the United States was very benevolent, you know, with the Marshall Plan. The United States did everything that they could to help Germany get back on its feet. And I don't know how much money was spent, you know, it was in the billions of dollars to help Germany get back and develop a, a democracy. Uh, and which, you know, has today. You're, you're as free in Germany as we are in this country now. And I would suspect it's a beautiful country, I know that, and that it's a really good place to live. That it's a, it's a wonderful place to live. And, and I think it depends so much on whether or not you're a free person, whether or not you can live your life, where you can work where you please, where you can believe what church you want to believe belong to and all of that sort of thing. You know what I mean? In the same way with France. And the Marshall Plan that did the same thing there and with Belgium and with Holland and Poland and all of that sort of thing. So, uh, and you, you go back to that question you asked now about did I feel that uh, all of this bomb have helped shorten the war? Well, probably it did. Probably it did. Because after all, you know, it depends upon what the masses of the, of the country, the, the people, you know, that they rebel and what they want to do. You know, so maybe it helped in that way, but I, I can't say that I feel like that hastened the end of the war or not. Okay, wonderful. Any more questions? Man, during World War II, I was a tail gunner in the B-17. Oh yeah. And uh, well, you know how it hard got shot down. It was a prisoner of war. Really? And uh, through the 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 whole uh, process that happened at that particular time, uh, when we were shot down, I had to walk right through the heart of Nuremberg. And I had been on two missions at Nuremberg yeah. at, uh, at, at just two days before that. And then had to walk right through Nuremberg and got to, to really see firsthand our crew. We all survived just how bad the damage really was. Yeah. The whole inner city of Nuremberg was destroyed. And so these gentlemen have come all the way from Nuremberg, our production crew, because they're doing an anniversary, a 60th anniversary of the bombing of Nuremberg, which happened in the latter part of February of 1945. I think it was like about the 20th or 21st, 23rd, right in there. Of well, now what, what we're looking at now is a flying fortress, a B-17 flying fortress. This was the airplane that was the predominant bomber by the 8th Air Force that was used by the 8th, For 8th Force when Germany was being bombed. And this is a restored flying, flying fortress that will actually fly. It actually flies still. And it goes to air shows all over the United States and things like that. And it's maintained just like, a very, like it was right back during World War II. Now this is the plane that I flew in during World War II, got shot down on the 25th mission. And that is when the, this situation happened of the bombing of Nuremberg just a couple of days before I was shot down and then walked right through Nuremberg. But this is actually the plane right here Oh, exact one of the planes that was actually in that particular situation. And so we were very fortunate here to be at the, uh, what's the place, the name of the museum, Texas? The Lone, Star Flight museum. the Lone Star Flight Museum. That's where we are right now, in the Lone Star Flight Museum. And, in, and this is where we were able to come. We're lucky that it was here and that we're able to do this and be able to be looking at this plane in January of 19, 
2005, isn't it? January 2005. And so that was 60 years ago that this very airplane was probably flying, and now it is still flying and has been restored here at this museum. Can you show us now where the gunners were sitting? All right. Well, in, in, in a B-17, in a B-17, in a B uh, there are, there is a tail gunner, there are two waste, tour, uh, waste gunners, there is a top turret gunner, and then there is a bottom turret gunner that's in that little turret right at the bottom of the plane. Then when you look up here in the front of the plane up here, uh, uh, th there's a gun right there, a 50 caliber machine gun. These are all 50 caliber machine guns. And when you look at that one right up there, I, I am now I'm assuming this now. I think that maybe the navigator or the bombardier actually operates that particular gun during combat. On uh, and and right here, you'll see there are two 50 caliber machine guns right down here in the front. And I would assume the bombardier would be the one that would be that actually would operate that turret gun. Yeah. See, right there. A gunner up there with the navigator. There's yeah. Reflexible guns on yeah. And there's one on the other side also, isn't there? Yes. So that means that there are, let's see, there's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, isn't there? There's 14 50 fat caliber machine guns on a B-17. We can go there and you can tell us? Yep. Okay. All right. Well, let's just kind of wander around here. You see, now, you're right up in here, uh, that's uh, where the bombardier is, see? And right there, up there is, is the bomb site, the Norden, is it called the Norden bomb, bomb site? Yep. The Norden, Norden bomb site. And that is the bomb site that the lead plane, where they are observing and watching the target. And remember when I explained to you that when you're on the bomb run, the entire formation for approximately 11 minutes just flies right straight and level, which gives the gunners on the ground all the opportunity to, to shoot up the flak and have it explode in the area where your plane is, see? But that is where the bombardier is, right there with that bomb site, which was a real secret thing during World War II. Uh, uh, nobody secret. ever had it, and you all, they always hit the target. Mm -hmm. It always hit the target because they were so accurate uh, with that. It was thought to be secret. Actually, the Germans had the, the site, and they were using it also. Very yeah, secret. yeah, mm -hmm. see? See, we, so we didn't have a monopoly on it. Even the, in the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe had, had these bomb sites, too, you know. Okay. But if you walk well, around, yeah. you'll notice it has, it's, of course, they have four engines. I don't know what the total weight of these things would be when they're la laid, you know, loaded with the bombs and everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, I tell you, it would really... I think it's it right was, around 60,000 pounds. Yeah, okay, about 60,000 mm -hmm. pounds. And so, uh, where are the bombs? Uh, they're right, right, right you underneath. You can go there. Right underneath here. See, right on, underneath here. Right, 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 right here. This is the bomb bay. Right here. See? And this opens up. They open up. See? They go, this comes this way, and then there's one over on the other side that goes the other way. And that's where the, that's where the bomb bay is, and that's where they have the bombs. They're all in a rack, and when the bombardier says the bombs away and pushes the trigger, and then all the other planes in the formation, and there's usually 16 in, in one group, in a squadron, and they all drop their bombs at exactly the same time. Boom, out, out they all go. Let's go to the place where the tail gunner was sitting. Oh, that's me. I, I, I was a tail gunner on one of these, believe it or not. And now, when, when you go, you go around, around, we have to go all the way around now, see? We have to go all the way around, and we can wind our way here. Come on, here we go. 
come on over this way. You see? And we come down here. Just stop. Stop here for a minute now and just pan that plane all the way. Isn't, isn't that a beautiful airplane? Huh? A beautiful airplane. Hey, this airplane could have 300 holes in it, Bert. 300 holes and still get back and bring you back home. A wonderful thing. Now, see, you come back over here. See, we come back here. Now, here's the tail. And right, right in here is where the tail gunner is. Now, that's the position that I was in uh, in flying in the B-17. And you would be flying backwards, of course. So you're flying backwards. And there's two 50 caliber machine guns, and they are lethal. The 50 caliber machine gun hits, and it really is very, very destructive. And, and as you can see, uh, see they've even got this, here's this site, and they say now that it's operational. Everything is operational. I just reconnected the cables so that the site yeah. moves with the guns. Yeah, see, see how they say, yeah. Come a bit closer. Yeah. Okay, here like yeah. this, like yeah, this. No, no, here, you you come and move the guns. And yeah, and yeah. You, okay. you move the guns. The All right, okay. okay. You do that. You see, now, <laughs> they, they, now here here's the site. See right here, and then uh, what you do, see uh, it, the cable. It's, it's all connected here. You can see how it moves along with the with the thing. Now, with, you know, one of the one of the things that you always had to be so careful of is where you were aiming because there are other uh, B-17s in the formation and you always had to be real careful uh, that you didn't start firing where one of your own planes were. But this is, and this is, uh, this is in, the t in the tail here, as you can see, and you can see there isn't very much room back in here. And, and you would have to go back into your position. You had to go back here into your position when, uh, uh, as soon as you got in enemy territory. And so you'd be back here and you'd, you're on your knees. You're sitting on your knees in here and you're on your knees in there for sometimes as long as eight hours at a time uh, before you could actually crawl back into the fuselage of the airplane. And how often and so, did you fire this machine gun? Well, well you know, I, I was kind of lucky because by the time I got into the war, you know, which was in the latter part of, uh, of uh, well, actually about the, the middle part of, no, it was the last part of 1943, the early part of 1944, there were not very many German fighters anymore. You know, because the American Air Force, the Allied Air Forces, dominated the air. And so they just weren't there anymore. So I only had the actually.